The North American continent was first populated by Aborigines who came across the land bridge from Asia into North America. When they settled in what is now the United States, there were four main groups, the Pacific Northwest hunters and fishers, the desert dwellers, the people of the plains, and the eastern woodland Indians. Now, remember that there were other tribes and clans besides these four. There were, for example, the Seminole Indians in Florida. And that brings up an important principle in teaching, a pedagogical principle. We must not teach everything. If there's one thing that, Dr., that Mr. Montessori said to me many, many times is, give them the keys, but don't overteach. It's a beautiful June morning, and here we are on the Ashley River at Charlestown Landing outside Charleston, South Carolina. And I'm in the company of two archaeologists. I'm Ashley Deming. Uh, I am a maritime archaeologist with the South Carolina Institute of Archaeology and Anthropology at the University of South Carolina. I'm Andrew Aga. I'm a historical archaeologist employed as an archaeologist here at Charlestown Landing State Historic Site one of our South Carolina state parks. They have assembled a selection of artifacts that will be the core of our conversation. Tell us about these things. Well, what we've got here today, Sanford, is an example of a lot of different types of artifacts that we'd find here in South Carolina, both on land and underwater. Um, the artifacts that we've chosen today uh, are artifacts that are would all be found actually here at Charlestown Land. Um, from a variety of different periods. Uh, we have Native American artifacts, uh, we have some uh, early period, uh, colonial period artifacts, uh, we've got Revolutionary War artifacts, uh, and we ha actually have some uh, African slave artifacts as well, and, and nautical artifacts. So we tried to get something uh, from every period uh, of occupation here at Charlestown Landing. Well, I mean, let's, let's look at it. This is, this is a piece of pottery. This was made 4,000 years ago. This is a piece of pottery that was made in the 17th century. This is a piece of pottery that was made in the 18th century. This is a piece of pottery that could have been made in the 19th century. I mean, we're all doing the same thing. We still are using pottery today uh, for dishes, and we're eating out of the same sorts of vessels. We're, we're drinking out of bottles. You know, we're, we're Germans we are made wearing this. shoes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Chinese made this. Uh, Native Americans made this. Possibly Africans made this. Absolutely. British people made this. But you look at it and it's stuff that you use at home to eat and drink out of. And basic needs and tendencies are there wherever you live on the planet. Uh, and, and here, being at such an amazing location like Charlestown Landing with the adventure behind us, we really get to see that the land and the water are not separate. No. It's a maritime landscape. We have to look at both places. When you're dealing with rice culture, you can't just look at a rice barge and tell everything about rice culture. You have to look at a plantation. How did, the, how did it work together? Um, we, as a maritime archaeologist, we don't just look at shipwrecks, we look at docks, we look mm -hmm. at historic landings, we look at wharfs, we look at bridges. All of those things are, are tying everything together. It's Maritime archaeology is really the interaction of people with the water. Uh -huh. um, it's not well, necessarily with, with just ships. Tell me about this ship here. Uh, I have learned that ships have to do with transport. They can either transport people, migration, a kind of migration, or they can transport goods, trade. Mm -hmm. Which of those domains was this ship, or was it both? Being in a in a place like like Charlestown Landing, um, with with great public archaeologists like Andrew, um, there's a lot of these places uh, all over the country where people can go, students can go, teachers can take their students to these places. Um, where they get an opportunity to really interact with history. This, this isn't just, even though the adventure is a replica, uh -huh. this isn't all a replica site. This uh -huh. is where people settled when they first came to Charleston. So yeah, um, they're doing active archaeology here at Charlestown Landing. Yeah. So um, there are volunteer opportunities for uh, students or teachers to even get involved and then take something back to their classroom. Yes. Um, and I'm sure that Charlestown Landing and a lot of other sites actually have curriculums that go along with uh, the historic site. So you could do something in the classroom bring them out to the site and then have something to follow up afterwards um, and every time you come here every time I come here I always look at something different um, there's so much going on that it's really hard not to just see different aspects of, of 
different things every time I come. So. And South Carolina and the South Carolina State Park System has several historic sites with archaeology at some of them and, and great historic interpretations and panels to read and replica buildings or original buildings. But we aren't the only state in our nation that has programs like that or a state park system that provides that for its public. Um, every state has a state park system and some of those parks, re, uh, they are helping to preserve and interpret for the public uh, historical resources. You can go into Florida and go to sugar mills that are carved out, of, you know, made out of carved limestone. You, you could go out west and probably learn all kinds of things about Western cult people out west or the That's Pony Express. Such you know, a good point because in this video, the teachers who are watching it are seeing the resources that we have found in the southeastern United States, particularly South Carolina and Georgia. But uh, and we found a street sign that says Oglethorpe. If you live in Milwaukee, it's not likely that you're going to find a street sign that says That's Oglethorpe. True. But That's it will say true. another name. Yes. And that always when I lived in New York, we worked with Wall Street. That was the wall around the fort. And uh, Broadway, a big wide street. Uh, Amsterdam. New Amsterdam before it was New York. Absolutely. All those connections can be made so easily if we as teachers use the imagination. Absolutely. And, and if you're struggling a little bit as a teacher, how, how do I find out about that? Um, I work for the University of South Carolina, the South Carolina Institute of Archaeology and Anthropology. Um, we're responsible for the uh, we're custodians of all cultural resources that, on state properties. Um, that's under the water, state waters, and on, on state property, a land property. Um, you could get in touch with your university. Um, maybe they have an anthropology program that, that features archaeology. Museums can put you in touch with people. Um, and we're, everyone's so excited uh, to share their passion about archaeology. So um, I, I have no doubt that there's a lot of different groups that you can get in touch with. Um, they can give you information about where can I find opportunities for myself or for my students. That's, that's really... Uh, what we want to do as public archaeologists, and I, I think teachers will find that most everyone's really receptive to, to share that information. Well, you've both certainly showed us that history is indeed all around us, at our fingertips. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right Absolutely. under our shoes. You bet. <laughs>